But real pleasure, fulfillment, comes from something much longer. So when you reach a point where you're 30 years old, you've been serious, you've learned all these skills, you've gone to school, but you've tried different jobs, and now you're ready to start your own business, and you have that level of, wow, I've done all these great things, that is a much greater pleasure and thrill that you'll ever have in life than from something immediate. <laughs> Hi, my name is Robert Green, and I'm the author of six books, including The 48 Laws of Power and The Art of Seduction, and you're watching Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Everyone, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Brand. Robert, thank you so much for your hospitality, uh, having us into your home. I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? How did I get this job? Well, I'm very lucky, but it's also a mix of luck and a lot of hard work. I was in my, this was, we're going back 25 years. Um, I was kind of a very struggling writer here in Hall, in Los Angeles. I was about 35 years old. I wasn't, I was kind of depressed. Things weren't really working out. I wasn't very successful. And I was in Italy on yet another job. And I met a man there who was also on the same job, who was a packager of books kind of like a producer of books. He designs them and puts the whole thing together. One day we were in Venice, Italy, and he just asked me a question. Do you have any ideas for a book, Robert? And suddenly, I don't know what it was, it was a sunny day, the gods were smiling on me, and all of my pain and everything I had been through in life, it just welled up in me, and I improvised a pitch, probably the greatest pitch I've ever done, about a book about power. And I told him a story and I kind of gave him an idea what it could be like. He was so excited. He said, Robert, you write a treatment for that and I'll try and sell it and I'll pay you for a year and a half to write it until we sell the book. And that was a turning point in my life. You know, I was, when it came out, I was 39 and I suddenly went from this kind of somewhat failing, you know, like one of the millions of failing screenwriters in Los Angeles to this whole other world. And it was the turning point in my life and I've never looked back. So that's why I'm here. If I hadn't met that man, I'd probably still be in that stupid one bedroom apartment in Santa Monica, an alcoholic and who knows what else. That is an amazing story. Um, you know, in this series, we like to tell origin stories. So if it's okay, I'd like, let's go back a little further in the chronology, maybe another, you know, uh, 20 years. And I ask it with context because uh, there's a lot of young people, and maybe not so young, people with life experience, who uh, may be resetting right now. You know, it's kind of a big reset. Or maybe they're coming right out of school and they wanna know what they, uh, they're trying to figure out what to do with their lives. What were you thinking early on as a kid? Um, I, I'm from this area too. I was born actually in Van Nuys, in Van Nuys Hospital, not too far from here, in the valley, um, and uh, have stayed in LA my entire life. So I, I love this little neighborhood. I love, you know, we're on the east side today, but um, what, did you, what were you thinking about when you were growing up? Well, um, I was very ambitious. I'm still very ambitious. I don't deny it, I don't hide it. You know, I wanted to be famous. I wanted to be successful. And I was always drawn towards words and language. I was obsessed with words from a very early age. And then suddenly around the age of nine or 10, I got really in love with books. And I knew by the time I was in high school that I wanted to be a writer. It was very clear to me. Who were some of those early influences? Well, I was reading a lot of novels like Fyodor Dostoevsky was one of my favorites. I read a lot of novels of Theodore Dreiser. I read a lot of, I read Machiavelli's The Prince when I was 15. I was even reading Nietzsche when I was in high school. These were some of my main influences among many, many others. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so I knew I wanted to become a writer. And you know, a lot of people, they can say, well, Robert, you're lucky because you had that clarity. But it's not that easy because I didn't know what I wanted to write, right? Yeah, and put a time step on that. What, what time period are we talking about here? You mean the actual year? You want me to reveal my, my, <laughs> my age? Well, I think no, that you've sorry. earned it. I no. think you, know, you no, have a right. certain amount care. of life experience. I don't care. Um, well, we're talking about, I was born in 1959, yeah. so we're talking like the mid-70s, basically. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, Hemingway sort of have just had his final hurrah maybe a decade before that, and, you know, and so that was maybe 
you know, a part of that. I, I think putting timestamps on stuff is so interesting because it really gives it context and relevancy of what was happening at the time. I mean, this is, you know, uh, pre-Vietnam War. Uh, this is, you know, America coming out of the, mm -hmm. of the 50s, uh, a very happy time heading into a very divided time. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I was sort of like the end of the whole hippie drug era. You know, I went to Berkeley. It was my first college. <clears throat> it was kind of depressing, actually, because, you know, it was sort of the, the, the rag end of the whole exciting movement of the 60s. There were a lot of drugs. It was a very kind of a heavy time, actually. The mid-70s is a very weird, confusing time for a lot of people. My dad talked a lot about it. Uh, he, he grew up in that same time period, that same area. Oh, I'm, the, I'm the same age as your dad, wow. So, well, he said he followed the Grateful Dead around. and you oh, know, so did I. And, uh, you Big know, right deadhead. There. I'm a total deadhead. Oh, yeah. I was. Yeah. And, you know, he, the way he describes it, it was fascinating, but also complex and volatile. And yeah. I mean, sort of everything and nothing has changed, right? Since then, it's still kind of volatile and complex, even today. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, how about your parents? Did they um, say... Robert, you should really think about uh, a career in engineering or get a real job as an attorney or something. Forget about this writing thing. Well, um, you know, my, I'm Jewish. And so Jewish parents, their dream is their son to be a lawyer or a doctor, mm -hmm. you know, and I never lived up to their dreams. Um, and they knew I wanted to be a writer. And they were, they were wonderful parents. I shouldn't complain. They never tried to, to you know, overtly tell me what to do. Yeah. It was kind of, you know, they were kind of covert about where I should go in life. But, you know, I, was, I had long hair. I can show you pictures. I look like a total druggy hippie yeah. back then. They were a little bit concerned, um, but they were very understanding. And when I got came, went to Berkeley and I was an English major, they didn't say, oh, start going to law school and things yeah. like that. Yeah, but this is also Sandy Koufax era too, right? Like the, we had... I met Sandy Koufax when I was a kid. Is that right? One of the high points of my life. Yeah, I mean, amazing, right? And, yeah. you know... If Sandy can do it, Robert can do his writing thing, right? Well, Sandy was a pitcher. I wasn't going to be at baseball, but... Well, well what I mean is Sandy didn't go into medicine or law, and he's, you know, a prolific Jew. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and my dad, all, all of our family on my dad's side is Jewish as well, oh. uh, with New York roots, and then uh -huh. moved out here to Hollywood. Uh -huh. um, so that resonates with me a little bit. I'm, yeah. I'm picking up on the vibe. Okay, uh, so you you got past sort of the maybe the pushback of the parents, you had enough courage or at least uh, freedom that they allowed for you to yeah. flex and go yeah. find yourself, you were at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. um, so what did you do between sort of the 20s and that age 39, where you're, you're a middle-aged man with your very first real marker of success, at least according to the world? Well, I had a lot of fun. So after I graduated college, um, I went and lived in Europe for several years. I traveled around with a backpack, and then I got jobs. I lived there for like several years. I ended up living in Europe for about four or five years, yeah. combined with several trips over there. Yeah. I worked in a hotel in Paris. I was a receptionist. I did construction work in, in Greece. I taught English in Barcelona. I worked in a television company in London. I was a tour guide in Dublin, Ireland. I had a blast and I was trying to write novels. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to New York. I'd never lived in New York before, thinking I would get into journalism because I wanted to, I had to make a living, right? I couldn't just write poetry and novels and such. Mm -hmm. So I got into journalism and I got a job at Esquire. So that was legitimate. My parents, you know, they could, they could be proud of that. And I got that job through my writing skills. I sent them a short story. And I was in journalism for many years wasn't a good fit. Yeah. I mean, it kind of sounds very Hemingway-esque, you know, traveling Europe and living in Paris and, and you know, also the editorial, yeah. right? I mean, it's sort of a... Well, it, uh, not quite as sexy as Hemingway because I wasn't working for very interesting magazines. Esquire was, but afterwards it kind of declined. Essentially, the lesson is it wasn't a good fit for me. And I could have blamed, at one time, a, an editor took me to lunch, something I'll never forget. I've talked about it before. And I, he was going to talk about an article I had written. And basically, he had like had his third vodka gimlet or whatever he drank. And he said, Robert, you're not going to make it as a writer. You don't have the talent. You're too undisciplined. Your writing is too all over the place. You don't know how to communicate. Go to law school. Go to business school. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm going to save you a lot of pain. <laughs> And, you know, instead of getting all upset and angry, I was initially, I don't deny it, 
it kind of sunk in that maybe because I wasn't excited about this career, it was showing up in my work. It was maybe my fault. So then I went back to Europe and I tried writing more novels and wandering around. I came back to LA to do my Hollywood career, you know, and I tried screenwriting. I worked for a famous film director. I was his assistant. Um, had some very interesting adventures. I learned a lot about writing and making things dramatic, etc. I learned a lot about power and the power game through the master manipulators yeah. in Hollywood that I observed. And then, you know, I wasn't, that's when we come to 1995, and I'm this depressed 36 year old living in my apartment in Santa Monica. There's so much there to unpack. I mean, uh, if I could just maybe highlight some of the lessons that I'm hearing. Um, one, it seems like you had tremendous self-awareness. You know, you were at least self-reflective enough to, to take the criticism and sort of take inventory and decide whether or not that was accurate. Um, I think that was probably another very pivotal moment in your life, it sounds like, where you could have, you know, sort of the rubber hits the road or you, you have this uh, come to God moment where you're just right. like, what am I gonna do? And maybe the lesson for people who are watching who don't have the life experience that Robert has is um, sometimes you do have to get brutally honest with yourself and um, you have to listen to the critics, at least the ones that, you know, what's that journalistic saying, consider the source. If the source is somewhat reputable, it's probably worth considering. Um, and then you take an inventory. Now, that said, there have been a lot of people who have gone on to greatness um, who were told very early on that they would amount to absolutely nothing. Right, right. I remember this, you know, uh, I think Einstein was three or four years old before he could even talk and they thought he was, he had, you know, mental challenges or right. Walt Disney, I, I can remember, you know, was told right. not creative at, in the least. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr., I mean, the list goes on of everyone That's who right. was told to sit down and shut up and they'd amount to nothing and then they went on to greatness. Um, in my experience, I think if we're going to call that adversity or an obstacle or a setback or a punch in the face, I think we have two choices. You know, you can get knocked down and stay down and kind of crawl away and go away. Or you can stand back up and come back and fight another day. It sounds like that's what you did. You, you know, you had this awareness, you came back. The other thing I want to point out is um, this idea that it's not original to me, but I, I continue to hear it in themes as I talk to people with great minds like you, is that nothing goes to waste. So I can remember, you know, um, my very first job, actually, I have to confess right now that I lied about my age. Uh, you had to be 16 to work at the uh, Lamp Post Pizza. Um, and, uh, but I was 15. You sure you want that information to be out there? I think it's safe now. It's past mm -hmm. the... the okay. uh, what do they call it? I don't them? want to read about this in the, in the newspaper, but okay. Apologies to, right. you know, everyone who would be ashamed of me for lying. But I, I had a, a goal in mind. I wanted to buy my first car, was, which was a 69 VW Beetle. It was $1,500. I wanted to get my license on my birthday when I turned 16. So I lied, and I worked for a year while I was 15 at the pizza place. Mm -hmm. um, I washed dishes most of the time and then, you know, worked my way up to making the pizzas. Eventually, I was even like, you know, serving the people. Anyway, I was running the place by the time I was 16. Um, I look back on that now, and the experience I had dealing with people and listening to my coworkers or trying, you know, all of that stuff, I'm now somewhat using, even now, that experience is so useful. And so I think about nothing goes to waste. You say you were struggling and maybe drinking too much, and yeah, probably it was a hard time. Um, but at the same time, you're traveling, you're in Paris and you're in Greece and you're getting all this life experience, uh, like Hemingway, who put himself in the battlefield, right, even though he wasn't in the war. Um, and, and, and that's what probably helped you get to this point of, you know, where, where luck meets opportunity, right? And you, you sort of are ready and prepared when, when the knock comes. Yeah, very well put. I mean, I think the key is is that I knew deep down inside of myself that I was a good writer, that I was, that I was worth having some kind of success in life. Yeah. I didn't get down on that part. I doubted you know, whether I could be a screenwriter or a novelist, etc. But I knew deep down that it was the only thing that I'm good at. Yeah. Well, you were dialing the frequencies, right? Just trying to find the right, right station. Yeah. You, were, you were in the ballpark, right? You were, 
Yeah. You're on the radio dial. You just had to dial the right frequency. Yeah. And so when I look back on it, it maybe it's a skewed per perspective, but it seemed almost like fate that I had to go through all of these kind of lost moments. But, um, but they were teaching me. They were, had a reason behind them. Yeah. I was almost being directed in this, in this way. And so, you know, my girlfriend and I, we once counted that I had like at least 60 different jobs. I've seen every kind of power maneuver. I have had the worst bosses in the history of, of mankind, I can, I can tell you, right? I had all kinds of experiences. And I had learned in journalism how to write snappy, how to write well under a deadline. It all came together when I had to write the 48 Laws of Power. All those awful bosses that, that you know, tortured me, I could put them in the 48 Laws of Power, completely disguised by kings and princes, etc. Right. So it was like the perfect, as you say, nothing was wasted. Yeah. So, so let's talk about power because it's a, 48 Laws is an iconic book. Um, you have a new book out. What is the title? The Daily Laws. Yeah. So let's, let's roll back a little bit from, uh, into 48 and then roll into the new one. Uh, so break down some of the, maybe the, the most important laws. There's 48. I mean, I'd love to talk about all 48, but maybe pick a couple that really stand out to you as useful in the context of, again, my audience, you know, these are people that read Inc. Magazine. These are go-getters. These are men and women who are ambitious and trying to just crush life at the same time trying to enjoy it and not work for assholes um, how do they hold their own how do they keep their power well um, there are many as you say there are 48 laws one of the laws is uh, i think the most important i can't remember the exact title of it but it's basically make people dependent on you right. so you want you don't want to appeal to people's love to the fact that they like you you want to appeal to the fact that they need you. Mm -hmm. Because if they love you, love is a very tenuous emotion. In fact, it doesn't work very well in the work situation. It causes all kinds of problems. They'll get rid of you tomorrow, even though they like you. But if they need you, it's like pulling out all of these roots of a plant to get rid of you. It's going to cause all kinds of damage all over the place. They need you and they can't get rid of you. So you need to make sure that your position in a company, in life in general, you're the only person who can do that. So you're not talking about bringing in bagels every morning because that's easily replaced. What, how, so how do we become irreplaceable or? Well, it depends on, on, on the nature of your work, obviously. I mean, I talk in that particular chapter of several strategies. So you're, let's say you're in a corporation. You kind of don't just depend on one person. You just don't aren't just necessary to the boss, but you spread yourself out to three or four different networks. You get a sense of every, how the whole company is functioning. You have your roots in this place, in this place, in this place. So you have more knowledge, it's kind of spread around, and to get rid of you is gonna cause a lot of problems because you're not only involved here, but you're involved here, here, and here. And you have knowledge that nobody else has. So you wanna have a kind of knowledge and skill base that makes you unique. You know, so um, and that means like just don't depend on one skill, but have several skills and don't be afraid to do that. That's I think is probably the key strategy here. But when it comes to if you're an entrepreneur, it's the same dynamic for an entrepreneur. It's the same dynamic for me. The way you make yourself necessary and, de and others dependent on you is to be the only person who can do this job. You are so un unique. There's only one Elon Musk, there's only one Steve Jobs, right? They're irreplaceable. They've, they're not afraid to be themselves, to, do, to do their, have their own style. And so, you know, that's, that's what secures their position. So if I wrote books like everybody else, I wouldn't have that position of power. But because I'm the only one, for better or for worse, who can write books the way I do, I have secured a position in the publishing world. So it's a law that applies everywhere. Yeah. Let me ask you about critics because uh, I think it's a it's a tightrope, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, you're walking this fine line of being abrupt or brash, or you know, and, and the, it seems like the more power and influence you have, the more criticism and pushback you, you might get. You know, we we see Bezos go into outer space and we're like, his rocket looks like a giant penis. Uh, it's just a flex. Who cares? He didn't make it to the moon, right? It's like, 
minimizing everything that he just accomplished because he's the richest man in the world or second richest at any given time. Um, it's easy to throw stones at him, right? So how much, if you're, if you're the person who maybe is trying to gain the influence and power, how much credence and how much do we listen to the critic and how do we, how do we manage that? Well, it depends on, you know, you have a sense of, in my book, Mastery, I call it knowing your life's task. This was what you were meant to accomplish in life, right? Yeah. And you're very firm about it and you feel very confident about it. And so when people come like that editor did and tell me that you shouldn't be a writer, you're able to deflect it because you have a dream and nothing will, will you know, get you to sidetrack from that dream. Yeah. But also having a sense of accomplishment. So it's not that you're a bullshit artist, it's not that you're a con artist. You've actually accomplished A, B, and C in life. Right? So if people come and attack me, I don't really care because I have this that I can always fall back on. I have a book that sold two million copies. How many people can say that? I don't care. Bring it on. It's, I'm fine with that. And, but, the, but the one other thing I would say about that is, is that you want to, in, in the case for all people of power and any position you are in life, I have a law in the 48 Laws of Power called Never Appear Too Perfect. And the danger in the world today is, the number one danger is envy. We live in a time of social media, etc., where it's massive envy, where we know what everybody else is doing in life, and we don't like to admit that we're envious, so we attack people passive aggressively. We subvert them, we try and throw obstacles in their way. We criticize them when in fact we envy them. And the strategy there is to learn how to deflect envy. So if you're Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, you have to have some humor, you have to have some self-deprecating humor. You have to take the criticism that comes and kind of laugh at it and go along with it so that you don't appear all stiff and rigid and defensive. Right. So that's the other thing I would say. Yeah, and I think they call that becoming thick-skinned or whatnot, right? You, you become accustomed. I mean, the reality is, and I can speak from experience, sometimes uh, the criticism really hurts because it's true. It's like, oh, that was shit. Eh. I guess you're right, and that's when it really stings, right? But you know, this is an opportunity to to take that in and you know absorb that for what it is. Um, and if it is true, at least in my case, I've tried to to use that as a uh, as a great um, gift that the stranger has given me. I mean, on a regular basis, when I p publish a video or write an article, there's always you know with the thumbs up, there's always at least one thumb down. And even, you know, uh, my young son, who's uh, 13, he'll say, Dad, who is this person that keeps giving you a thumb down? And I said, you know what? Um, it's probably one of my peers or mm -hmm. someone who wants to be and do what I'm doing. And, uh, and envy. It, it could be. That's my theory, at least. Yeah. Uh, or it could be some dude in his underwear in his, in his mom's basement with nothing better to do. But, um, but you're right. Um, we have to balance that out. We have to be able to distinguish between what is legitimate criticism and you have to look at the source, yeah. right? Yeah. So whenever I write a chapter, I give it to my girlfriend, Anna, because she's a great editor. I trust her. She critiques the hell out of them, yeah. but I've trusted her. But if some schmo off the street is writing on a YouTube video, comments about me, etc., I don't pay it any attention because I don't know who he or she is or what their credentials are. Right. Anonymous doesn't get much credibility with me. If they want to show their face and show up and, and, and you know, spar with me, I'm happy to do so and, and listen to their, their criticism. But anonymous, no. Uh, I'm curious, was there an alternate title to 48 Laws? Was that just it from the very beginning? It's like, this is what it yeah, is. There was. We had a few versions of it. One version was the Black Book of Power. Yeah. A black book is kind of like a summation, it's like the ultimate book on a subject. Yeah. But we thought that that sounded a little too dark and evil and we, people wouldn't know how to, what, how to take that. Yeah. But that was one of the alternative titles. Almost there's like a, like a James Gandolfini style, like a people's names that you could look up. That would maybe not yeah. translate very well. I yeah. got you. But and then also, uh, I, the number 48 kind of shifted. Originally I had like 52 laws. We didn't like the number 52 because it seemed too obvious, like 52 weeks in a year or something. Mm. And so we kind of, I tried to narrow it down to 48 because 48 is such a powerful number. Mm -hmm. Whereas the 47 laws of power, I don't know. Well, so what is it about fours and eights that's powerful? It's just obvious. You don't have to think about it. 48, it just seems like something. It's two times 24 hours in a day, two days. 
it's just got a resonance to it. There's kind of a symmetry mm -hmm. to the idea of 48, you know. I think I could have done 44 laws because that has a nice symmetry to it. Mm -hmm. But there's just something, I don't know if it's in retrospect where because the book has had success that 48 seems so powerful. But the number just has a visceral feel to it. I can't even explain. Yeah. Sometimes you just know and it's intuitive and it's, it's just instinctual. I love it. Uh, any other powers that come to mind that you want to share? That are uh, that are noteworthy that we should talk about. Well, uh, I, there's one in their interaction with boldness, mm -hmm. and um, this is particularly applicable to entrepreneurs. Um, it's about how human nature we're kind of impressed and intimidated by people who do some, who enter in with a lot of confidence and boldness and a bit of drama and surprise. It kind of appeals to the animal in us. We're put back on our on our on our on our feet, yeah. and we're like, whoa. What's going on here? It's impressive. It creates, it creates a distinctive impression. Whereas if you kind of enter in like with your business or your book or in, in a meeting, and you're kind of half-assedly promoting an idea, it already looks weak before it even started, right? right? If you don't have confidence in your own idea, how can I have confidence? Right. And there's an element almost of bullshit and, con and being a con man. And I have a story in there of Christopher Columbus who was in fact, um, came from uh, the lower classes, had no aristocratic connections, was a mediocre navigator and captain, and he went and proposed th this to the Portuguese king, this incredible expedition, as if he was an aristocrat. He was full of all of this confidence, and it, it, you know, it created an impression on the other. There must be a reason for that confidence. Yeah. So having a sense of you were destined to accomplish something, that you're, you feel that it's, it's, going to, it's going to succeed, it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Now, uh, a couple years back, I had Susan Cain on, and Susan is famous for writing that book, Quiet. It's a book about introverts and extroverts, and in fact, she also talks about ambiverts, a hybrid of introvert, extrovert. Uh, can introverts do this as well? Can they sort of uh, exude or, you know, um, at least... Uh, convey this confidence even when they're not feeling so confident. Sometimes, I mean, I, I am sort of a classic introvert, I have to say. Um, and sometimes I'm, I, you know, I, I don't want to be the loudest in the room because it just annoys me. Um, I, what would you say to introverts? Well, I'm an introvert. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a classic introvert, and yet I, I've used it. It's more a sense of you feel a con you have to know your strengths and play to your strengths. So if I tried to show this kind of confidence and boldness on a basketball court, I'd be laughed off. Right. If I tried to show it with my artwork and my painting and my doodling, I'd be, I wouldn't be able to pull it off. But I know that I have one thing that I'm strong at. It's with words and language and writing. And so I can pull off being bold because I feel in, inside myself that inner confidence. Yeah. You have to almost deceive yourself that you can accomplish this. So I can go on the list through classic introverts have been incredibly successful. Albert Einstein was a terrible introvert, even though he became, he seems like he's sort of this comic person who's good with people. He was terrible, very, you know, very uh, awkward and timid. But he knew one thing that he was so good at, and he pushed on and pushed on and pushed on it. And when it came to physics and relativity, there was nobody else who could argue with him. Mm -hmm. So play to your your strength, play to what you know, what you're good at, what you've accomplished. And even the worst introvert in the world like myself can have, can exude that kind of boldness. Yeah. So let's talk about this. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing you tell me uh, your answer already, but let's just maybe flesh it out a little bit more, which is this idea of, you know, should you follow your passion or you should follow what you're good at? What is the order of operations? Well, it's very clear. You have to know yourself. You have to know who you are. And you have to do some searching in there. So the passion thing, it's kind of a cliche in a way. I want you to look at the things that you were drawn to when you were three years old, four years old, five years old. I do consulting work with a lot of people, people who are kind of confused about what I call your life's task. And we go through a process. You want to see something that attracted you here so deeply, you can't even put it into words. Because the way the human brain works is that you don't learn things with any kind of intensity unless your emotions are deeply, deeply engaged, unless you're excited by the subject, right? Yeah. Um, and so if you're kind of 
in a field that is because of the money or because it kind of half interests you, you're not going to be learning. You're not going to have that intensity of focus that all successful people have. There's a, there's a kind of a, a level that you hit where the work is exactly what you were meant to do. It's what excites you. It's what your skill level, you're up to the challenge. Or maybe it's a little above you and it brings out the best in you. And you want to find out what that field is or what that subject is. And so once you find it, everything else will fall into place. So for me, I knew it was writing. I just couldn't figure out which writing form of it. But once it occurred, everything else just fell into place for me. I want to go back to that moment at 39, that moment of desperation, but also of opportunity when it was knocking. Was there a time that you sort of gave up and you thought this is not working out? You know, I mean, it sounded like you were sort of at the end of your rope at that moment, at that crossroads. I can sort of picture it as a movie scene in my mind right now. Um, but I'm also willing to bet that you were very close to just throwing in the towel at that, in that very moment, too. Um, talk about that. How, did you, how were you able to survive that? Because, again, the context of this question is, I'd be willing to bet that a lot of people give up too soon. Yeah. They quit because it's too hard or they don't see the results. Um, talk about that. Well, when you're 36 years old, 35 years old, it's very easy to quit because you're not in your 20s anymore. And you, you're starting to think, I need to make money. I don't want to be living hand to foot for the rest of my life. Yeah. So I understand that a lot of people reach that point, you know, and I was very depressed. I was kind of going up and down and up and down. I think, okay, now I'm going to write this and this will be successful. I'll sell this screenplay, et cetera. You know, and then it wouldn't happen, I'd be down, etc. So it was kind of a roller coaster. And there were moments when I was pretty much ready to give up, but I was never going to like suddenly go to law school or go to business school. I was too old for that. Yeah. So I was thinking of, um, sorry, I was thinking, well, maybe I need to try a different form of writing where I can make a living. You know, maybe I need to get into television and sell my soul, even though that'll be very, very depressing for me because I don't feel comfortable mm -hmm. with that form of writing. I have to get practical in some way. And that was a very depressing thought because, you know, we all have dreams, particularly when we're a child. And to me, the worst thing in life, the worst feeling is you had dreams and you can never live up to them. They never, they never happened in reality. Yeah. And so... That would have been giving up on a dream. It would have been selling my soul. I would have been able to write, but I would have been unhappy. I probably I may not even be alive right now if I had fallen down that rabbit hole. And I recognize how lucky I am. Yeah. Well, it's kind of a... Shakespeare wrote about that too, right? Um, what is the quote? I can't probably get it right. There's a tide in the... There's a... I was thinking about the, the one about regret, you know, um, oh. neither pen nor tail, you know, uh, where he talks about if you didn't try to do what you thought you were capable of doing, yeah. that you would live with the regret. And effectively, that's the definition of hell, yeah. as, as living with regret, the, the greatest pain yeah. of what could have been. Yeah, well, Da Vinci has a quote on that that I use in my book, Mastery. He says, I, I forget, I can't quote it, I can't remember, but the essence of it is, at the end of a day of working hard, you feel kind of a satisfaction that you got a lot accomplished. At the end of your life, when you feel like you've worked hard and you've kind of done what you were supposed to do, you feel like you had a blessed life. And the reverse of that, which he doesn't discuss, is it's the end of your life, you're in your 60s or 70s, and you're reflecting back about all your missed potential. That is true hell. So what should we be measuring while we're alive and kicking? You know, how should we be measuring our success beyond the vanity metrics, right? You can look at your, your book and you sold two million copies. That's amazing. But what if you write an amazing book and it sells less than that? You know, it's still valuable, right? It's still making an impact. But how, how do we measure the success? What's your recommendation? Well, um, it depends. You know, you don't have to sell as, as many copies like that. But um, if you have an, an idea, if you give all of your effort, if you work really hard and you put all of your focus into it, and you've done, like you wrote a book with lots of research, and you know it's a good book, and yet it only sells 2,000 copies, you can feel a bit upset about it. You're gonna be upset about it, no doubt, but you're gonna bounce back. 
because you knew that you put in all the effort. And you know, failure is a good thing. Failure teaches you what your limitations are. Because if you go through life and you have success after success, you're never learning. And then you're going you're gonna to have a much f further, a w much worse downfall because you're going to get grandiose. So failure is a good thing. As long as you put in the effort, as long as you did your, the job the best you could, okay, it didn't sell so much, I can learn from it and I can go on to the next project. Because if that failure defeats you inside, then you're, you're done because you're never going to recover your, your confidence. Your next effort is going to be even more, um, you know, half-assed, etc. So you have to, it all comes from within. So when you have that failure, learn from it and put yourself in a position where you're ready to make, to bounce off to the next project. Yeah, I love that. Talk about mastery. Well, mastery came out in, I think, 2013, 2012, something like that. I was basically writing it because, honestly, I was getting a lot of feedback from my first three books. A, a lot of my readers are young. I have a, 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 they, they skew a little bit male, 18 to 30, it tends to be. And I was getting emails about power and war and seduction that was beginning to trouble me. It was as if people had the idea that just kind of being a bullshit artist and playing the political game was enough to be successful in life. It reminds me of like, uh, that movie uh, Wall Street with uh, what was it? Gordon Gecko was his name. That character. It's just like, just snowplow everyone. Right. You know, typical kind of '80s yeah. mentality. Yeah. Yeah. And I was feeling like a young, a lot of young people were having that, and that's not. You know, that's important. I wrote the books. It's important to be able to understand the power game, how to deal with egos, etc. Yeah. But if your work isn't based on anything real, if you don't have real skills, if your work is shoddy all the bullshit in the world won't be able to cover it up, right? It's going to show through. And I was really worried that people didn't understand how to make things, how to build things. I was having visions in my mind of 40 years from now, bridges would be collapsing because people don't know how to be engineers anymore. Right. They learn a sense of, of the process of mastering something, right? A lot of it comes from social media and the internet, where people have this impression that you can have power and that there's shortcuts for anything, right? Well, yeah. And people have written books on it, right? I can think of Tim Ferriss, The 4-Hour Workweek, which is a, which is a yeah. life hack, and with all great intentions, by the way, right? He's all great intentions, but completely contrary to my belief. Yeah. My belief are there are no shortcuts in this life. You have to be able to put in the work. You have to be able to fail. You have to try again. You have to go through an apprenticeship phase. You have to try and get a mentor. You have to learn. Then maybe you can become creative and here's how you become creative. And once you reach that point where all of your knowledge and skill reaches that creativity mastery level, the game will flow and it'll be easy and you'll have a great life. Yeah. Okay, but get out. So the reason I wrote mastery is we humans only do things that are pleasurable, right? We're attracted to the things that give us pleasure and we, re we refrain from things that give us pain. Yeah. But we, how do we define pleasure? For most people, particularly young, it's instant. I want things that are quick. I want to get a, that, that jolt from a two-hour movie or from a video game or maybe from a week's worth of work. Well, yeah, the whole fast food movement was born on that. Yeah. yeah. But real pleasure, fulfillment, comes from something much longer. So when you reach a point where you're 30 years old, you've been serious, you've learned all of these skills, you've gone to school, but you've tried different jobs, and now you're ready to start your own business, and you have that level of, wow, I've done all these great things, that is a much greater pleasure and thrill that you'll ever have in life than from something immediate. So think of your sense of pleasure, draw it out to five years, 10 years, 20 years, have a plan. So when you reach a point where you actually realize your dreams, that is the ultimate high you can ever have. So I wrote that book to make people aware that reaching a point of mastery and creativity is, is the most ecstatic thing. It's a peak experience, to, to use Maslow's terms. It's worth going through all the pain. Yeah. It reminds me of the marshmallow test, too, this famous psychology study of the marshmallow test. You know this, where they put you know, a marshmallow in front of this, the, like a five-year-old, and they said, you know, if you'll just wait uh, 15 minutes, uh -huh. uh, we'll give you two marshmallows. Uh -huh. So don't eat it. And they would put the marshmallow in front of the kid, and they would leave the room. Of course, there was a two-way window, window, yeah. window, and they would watch. And, and you know, the, there was uh, 
kids who had just couldn't wait and they just devoured the marshmallow. And then, of course, there were a certain number that would you know, just wait. Okay, I'm going for two. And I think they followed those kids for a couple of decades. Wow, wow. Um, That's a great study. Well, and, and definitely found, as they extrapolated that, that the kids who were able to wait and have patience were more successful, at least on paper, than the kids, you know, who did they do? Did they do like three marshmallows and four and then find out that the four marshmallow kids were like turned into like super? Right. I'm sure that there's a law of diminishing returns on that marshmallow study. test. I never heard of it. Yeah. Uh, but it's, I think it was done in the 60s, pretty famous. Um, but, but what you're saying in essence is, um, and I feel this too all the time, even now that I'm older than I used to be when I was coming out of school, and that is patience. You know, and again, we've kind of come full circle back to nothing goes to waste, right? That the the dues I paid washing the dishes, the pizza place, then was a springboard to, for me to, you know, do the other things in my life, deal with difficult people, right. um, bosses who were on an ego trip. Let's now bring this full present. Um, talk about what's what is most on your mind right now, and as you've you know, written this new book, what you'd like people to take away from it? What, what was your intention? You know, there's kind of been a theme to all of my books, all six of them, although they cover all sorts of different subjects. And if I could boil it all down to, it's having a realistic attitude towards life. It's to not look, to be able to look at yourself with a degree of honesty and say, these are my strengths, these are my weaknesses. To be able to look at people and understand some of who they are and not project onto them your own emotions and not see into them what you want to see into them, but who Brian Elliott actually is, a process of kind of empathy and this sort of social skills that we can develop, and the ability to see the world as it is. These are the trends happening in the world. This is the future of my career. This is where the world is going. You have that kind of realistic attitude. It's like a sharp diamond. It'll cut through anything. You imagine if just you had one of those powers. If you could see into people and see through their smiling masks and understood what's really going on, imagine the power you would have. It'd be amazing. Can so, I ask you, yeah. do you think that you've changed significantly, you know, as Robert, you know, who you are? I think, you know, identity, I kind of feel like I'm still kind of figuring out who I am. But at the same time, in the same breath, I would say I sort of feel like about every decade, I kind of reinvent myself or rediscover myself. Have you had that experience? Yes and no. It's kind of a balance between the two. Yeah. So the person that I was at five years old, there's kind of a through line going all the way to me now. I'm 61, 62, yeah. right? So um, I can kind of see the child still inside of me, yeah. that I'm still kind of Robert Green, that, that little boy who was really interested in war and baseball, etc. But yes, I've gone through many changes. And the period in which I wrote the 48 Laws of Power is not where I am right now. So I've gone through many shifts, and I think that's very healthy. Yeah. And we're a product of our environment, too. And again, that's why we went back to context. Sure. You know, when you were thinking about what you were thinking about in the 60s, uh, yeah. things change and environments change, and even, you know, where you were born. Uh, how much do you think about nature and nurture? Do you think about this at all? Yeah, well, you know... <laughs> Part of our problem these days is we're too black and white in the way we think. Things are never one way or the other. They're always a mix. And that's kind of where wisdom comes from, is being able to see the middle way. So we're a mix of nurture and nature. Undoubtedly, genetics play a component. And I talk about that in Mastery. So the fact that I have this insane attraction to words is genetic. I don't, I, I'm sure of it. Yeah. And there's a great book called The Five Frames of Intelligence by Howard Gardner, in which he says, the way your brain is wired, there's one kind of set of intelligence that you're attracted to. It could be math, it could be kinetics and movement, mm -hmm. it could be patterns, and which will lead to like music, etc. Yeah. But you have, those are genetic, no doubt about that. Yeah. But then nurture plays an incredibly important part. Just think of the fact that you're one years old. Do you know how vulnerable and what a sponge you were when you were that young? Yeah. Your whole life depended on one or two figures. You were paying such deep attention. Do you know how the, inf the power that has on you? You're not aware to this day how you were formed in those first months of your life in a completely preverbal way. So they're both equally, equally play a role. So people who 
emphasize one or the other. They're just foolish, I think. Yeah, I, I got to talk to um, Sir Ken Robinson uh, before he passed. Uh, we became fast friends. I was, you know, definitely enamored with his work. He wrote the book Element, which is, yeah. you know, kind of along the lines of what you're talking about, finding your true passion, fish to water, bird to air. Uh, and he talks about this idea of how we, some of us, you know, the, the plan that's not in the minds of the people who are in our control or our, our governance or maybe our parents sometimes gets beaten out of us or, or we get talked totally, out of it. Totally. You know, I shouldn't be a writer, you know, that, you're never going to make any money or forget about singing or filmmaking or, you know, uh, I still think we have to be careful of that, um, that nurture because sometimes it's, you know, it's, uh, it's ironic how unnurturing it can be. People with good intentions give bad advice, you know. Oh, you mean when you're very young? You know, it doesn't, I don't think it's, I think it's age agnostic. I think, you know, um, and that's why I was sort sure. of wondering, you know, um, how you, what are the signals to know whether you should pivot or, or, or give it up and go to law school? You know, a lot of people will just quit. And so it's, it's, it's always on my mind because maybe I'm, I'm close to it all the time. I come right up to the, uh, you know, to the, to the bubble and then, oh, something happens good. And then I can, I can go back and. You know, I don't have to break well, it all comes to, so I was talking about a realistic attitude, it all comes down to being able to see into yourself yeah. with a degree of clarity. So the great psychologist Abraham Maslow called it, I believe, impulse voices. And he says that when a child is six, eight months old, they have these impulse voices. They like this candy, they like this bit of food, and they hate that one. Right. It's something inside of them, they know it, they're, they are aware of it in a very primal, preverbal way, and so they choose this thing that they're going to eat. Right? We all have these voices, but then as we get older, we lose sense of them. We're not hearing them anymore because we're hearing teachers telling us this is what we're good at, this is what we should be. We're hearing friends, we're hearing the culture saying this is what's cool and what's not cool. And by the time we're 16 years old, that impulse voice is drowned out by a hundred other voices yeah. and we don't know who we are anymore and it's very depressing and it's why people turn to drugs and alcohol and porn etc. They lose a sense of themselves, of who they are and that is the worst thing that can happen to you. So it's a matter of self-awareness and going through a process. We talk about the need, you know, patience of being able to look at yourself and I, what I get people to do is we go through a process of journaling and we dig deep and we say, these are the things I could see when I, throughout my life that I love. That when they happen, when I hear about them, I get so excited. These are the things I hate. Mm -hmm. And I give them an example of myself. I know, for instance, if I open the internet or, or, or the New York Times or any newspaper, and there's an article about early humans from 80,000 years ago, I have to read that article. I am so obsessed with our origins. It's been that way since I was four years old. Yeah. That's the impulse voice. And I, on the other hand, I hate working for people. I hate political games. I hate the feeling that I have to play, that I have to court this incompetent buffoon who's my boss. That's another impulse voice that's now sending, you have to be an entrepreneur, Robert. Yeah. I love that you're so in tune. Uh, maybe a couple final questions. Um, what do you consider your greatest failure i.e. learning experience, or, and juxtaposed by your greatest accomplishment? Well, they're kind of two sides of the same story. I mean, I don't know if this is quite your question, um, but I did a book with the rapper 50 Cent, right? Called The 50th Law is my fourth book. And um, so the, 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 the story combines both sides. So. Um, was this a publicist's idea or your idea? Like, well, I it was kind of um, a publicist put us together. His agent put us together, and then uh, I don't like working with other people as you as you all know now, and I don't like co-writing either. Well, and it's but, such a departure from. I mean, it's like oil and vinegar. It's well, there's no there's no power in it, but um, I really liked him. I thought he was really interesting. He wasn't what he I thought he would be like, and I wasn't what he thought I'd be like, and I thought. There could be an interesting book here bringing this kid from Southside Queens who's a crack dealer and this middle-aged Jewish boy from Los Angeles whose father was a chemical salesman. Who would ever think of putting those two things together? Yes. Something will happen. Okay, so I'm starting to write the book. I'm a little bit intimidated. 
because I want to please 50. I want this. And so I'm focusing a lot about him. I'm interviewing him and I'm writing about his business and about his life. And in the process, I was kind of losing who I was, you know, and, and my voice and what would make the book really interesting. It's supposed to be a combination. And then the publisher, Simon & Schuster, they had some of the, the chapters together. They basically um, said, you know, they cut loose the deal. They said, it's off. We're kind of firing you in essence. Mm. The contract, we're voiding the contract. They didn't like the content? They didn't like, they didn't like the content. And they thought it was taking too long. Both of those oh, things. Okay both of those things. And that was really painful because up to then I had three books that were very successful. I had never really known failure on that professional level. It was very painful to me. What are you talking about? I'm Robert Greene. I write books. Come on. Yeah. yeah. And then my agent got me in touch with somebody else who was a very smart guy, Bob Miller. He was with Harper back in those days. And he, he led the manuscript and he said, Robert, the problem here is there's too much, there's not enough of you in it, mm -hmm. right? You need to bring more of yourself into this book. And it was painful to hear, but he was right. Mm -hmm. I listened to him because he's, an, he's a very established publisher. Mm -hmm. And so I go, okay. I'm gonna, and then he said, all right, well, I'm going to get you a new deal with Harper. That's the good news. The bad news is you only have eight months to write it. And that's like, I can't write a book in eight months. Never been able to do that, okay? But I had no choice. It was like, get rich or die trying. Mm -hmm. You know, I either succeed or this is another, this will be a failure that may hurt me, really hurt me in the long run. And so I got into it with incredible energy and I poured myself into the book, a little less 50, a bit more of me. And because I only had eight months, I was writing with like this urgency that I never had before. I pulled it off wrote the book and it's been very very successful since then sold hundreds of thousands of copies 50 loved it so um that was kind of like a seed of failure i wasn't being myself and then true success i returned to being myself i mean we were just sitting back you know <laughs> chopping it up reminiscing about the good old days and all that <laughs> you know tracking my roots where i came from and